All right, so we're kind of... 1 Kings chapter 17 is a little bit of a different chapter from what we're used to. Obviously, this is the book chronicling the kings of Israel, and we're going through, we saw, um, and not just Israel, we got some kings of Judah and Israel kind of mixed in with this book. It started off with, um, you know, King David and King Solomon, and, that, and, and spent a little bit of time there, a few chapters there. And uh, this entire chapter, we're not really talking about any of the, well, briefly, Ahab, I think, is in the very beginning of this, of this chapter, but that's... Um, that's about it. We don't, we don't hear from him again. We're starting to learn a little bit. This is the first time in the Bible that Elijah the Tishbite is mentioned. So I, I'm really excited because Elijah is an awesome character in the Bible. He's a great man of God. And, and we're going to read the next few chapters, a lot of the things that he did. And, and just, it was just really cool to see who he was and some of the awesome things that he did for God. And... Um, so let's, let's jump right in here in verse number one. The Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. It is real interesting. I love the way it just kind of throws it out there. Elijah the Tishbite, it's kind of like, who is this guy? Elijah the Tishbite, just of the land of Gilead, a nobody, Right? He just, he says, he makes his proclamation unto Ahab the king. And he says, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, you know, he says, there's not going to be dew, rain, these years according to my word. And of course, the reason is that we learn this later, we learn this from other chapters, Ahab is an extremely wicked king. And we're going to find out that, that he was the whole cause behind it. Ahab gets angry, he thinks Elijah's the problem, he's the source of the problem, but Ahab was the problem. And this is a curse that, that, um, that Elijah is speaking here, and God listens to it. Now, the, the first lesson we can learn from this is expect your prayers to, to happen. See, Elijah, you know, makes this pronouncement, and, uh, and, and really it's, we find out from James chapter 5 that, that Elijah is a, is a man of like passions like as we are. Yet he prayed earnestly unto the Lord that it would not rain for the space of three and a half years, and it rained not. And you could, you could read that, and I'm probably barely misquoting that, but in James 5, it talks about that. And, that, and then he asked again, and the Lord you know, brought the rain. So God hearkened unto the voice of Elijah, and he listened to him. This is something that Elijah was asking God to do. And God heard his prayer. And when we go in prayer, we need to expect our prayers to actually happen. Jesus Christ said in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, stay where you're at there. Jesus said, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. God wants us to go to him with full confidence, knowing and having that full faith in him that, hey, God is all powerful. God is capable of doing anything. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. Whatever it is that we need in this life, whatever it is, whatever the things are, even some of the desires of our heart, you know, if, if, they're, if they're right with God, if it's according to God's will, if it's something that's good, if it's something that's righteous, you know, if you're not just, just praying for something to consume on your own lusts, or consume, you know, that, that's, that's not actually good for you, something that's sinful or something, you know, something that you shouldn't be doing, God's not going to answer those prayers. But if it's something that's good, if it's something that's right, or if it's something here, like God's going to get the glory in this event of, of it not, you know, of this, you know, there's judgment coming upon a wicked king and a wicked people that were following these kings and, and, and getting involved in all the idolatry and stuff that, were, that was brought before them then God will, will hearken unto that and listen to that. Now, I'm not going to say that this prayer that Elijah made here was a foolish prayer by any means. I think it was good. I mean, God, God answered it. But what I also want to draw attention to is that we need to be careful that we don't pray foolishly. For, you know, be very careful with things that you pray for. Think them out. You know, don't, don't, don't pray flippantly because God might just answer those prayers. <laughs> it might not end up being something that you, you want to have happen. Now, we know that, that, that you know, the, the Spirit um, works with our spirit and, and will help us to pray to God the things that we ought to pray to Him. But God does hear us. And, and, and He can't answer our prayers. So, I mean, Elijah's asking here for it not to rain until he says so. But that's going to affect Elijah also. It's going to affect a lot of people. 
And like I said, I don't think it's a foolish prayer, but, but something so powerful in expecting something like that to happen, just realize God is capable of doing all these things. And whatever it is that you're praying for, remember that God is able to do it. It's never a good idea to be extremely emotional and, and start going to God with a bunch of things before you've kind of really thought out what, what's the right way to go. Especially if like maybe you're angry or something and you're praying, oh God, can you, you know, take care of this person, whatever, you know, n not necessarily anything wrong with, with, you know, we look, read the Psalms and you can see there's, there's definitely imprecatory prayer. There's, there's some things that could be righteous and not wrong to pray for, but make sure that you're not just letting emotion take over and, and not using some sense when you, when you go to God and pray. Because God is a powerful God and, and he does answer prayer. He does hear us. So uh, we'll just keep that in mind. Let's keep reading here in, in 1 Kings 17. Verse number two, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kirith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So now we have God turning to Elijah because he's heard his prayer. So now he's saying, well, here's what I want you to do. You need to hide yourself by this brook. This is where I want you to be. There's going to be water there and don't worry about anything because I've already commanded the ravens to feed thee. What a cool thing. I mean, it's, that, it, it's, it's so unique. It's so different. Just go off to the, this is where I want you to be, Elijah. You go there. Don't worry about anything. You don't have to bring anything. Just go in this spot and I'll make sure you're taken care of. I've commanded the birds to bring you food. And look at what happens here. Verse number five. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Kirith, that is before Jordan. And, and I love that about these great men of God. You'll notice with Abraham. You'll notice with Moses. You'll notice with Elijah that when God says to do something, they just, they have that much faith to be able to say, you know, I'm just going to go and do it. Say, well, what do you mean the birds are going to feed me? I, I, I need to do something. You know, people want to rely on their own wisdom thinking like, no, God, you know, I can't just rely that some bird's going to feed me there. I need to do something else. I need to spend a little bit more time getting prepared, getting other things ready, and then I'll go over there. That wasn't the attitude Elijah, Elijah had at all. That's not the attitude Abraham had when, when God told Abram to get up, get the ants, and go out into this land that you've never been to before, and I'm just going to lead you and direct you, and you just need to trust that where I'm taking you is going to be fine for you. And all throughout the Bible, you'll see the men that have the great faith. The people that did the most for God had this type of faith, this level of faith to be able to just say, whatever it is, whatever you got from me, God, I'm going to do it. And Elijah did that. He did. He said, okay, I believe you. If God said that, if God said he's going to do whatever, I'm going to believe it because God said it. God said he's going to use the birds to feed me. I don't know how exactly how it's going to happen, but I'll just go. And we see what did, what did happen. Verse number six. It says, And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. He was just fine. He was getting fed two, twice a day. He got some meat and he got some bread. Twice a day. These birds are coming. Imagine that. He's, he's there sitting by the brook. He's got his, his uh, food delivery, right? Right to his doorstep. The birds drop off the food for him. All he's got to do is eat it. You know, I don't know if he had to prepare the meat or whatever, but not a bad deal. There's this, this famine started, or the, the drought, I should say, because it's not raining and there's not even any dew. And he's being fed and he's got some water there. Now, I believe that it is important to be, pre be prepared for anything as much as possible. I think it's a good attribute to have. I think, I think it's something that we should have, especially as men. I think it's prudent. I also believe in being as independent as possible where you don't have to rely on other people so much. I think that that is a good quality, a good skill. You should be able to take care of yourself, take care of your family, be prepared for... for Hard times, you know, I, I, I'm into, if you will, the, the prepper thing, but only, so, but very limited, okay? I think it's a good idea. I think if you have resources, if you already have means, it's not a bad idea to put away some food, put away some silver, put away some guns, you know, for a rainy day. But that should not 
be your main focus. That should not consume you. And really, if you don't have the means for it, that should, that's like the, probably the last thing that should be on your mind. I've got no problems with people getting some things prepared. Like I said, because there's all kinds of things that can come your way. You can lose your job. You, you know, it, it's good to have a little bit of resources kind of there to fall back on. But what we don't want to do is get all crazy about it to where it's like you're just sitting out, you're kind of like burying your, your um, talent in the ground and doing nothing with it and it's not doing anything for anybody. Because here's, here's what it ultimately comes down to. God needs to come first. So if something like being a prepper is consuming you and say, oh, no, I can't do all these church activities and this church stuff because I got to get this food and I got to get this other stuff and I got to get my ammo and I get all those other things put away first. That's not right. We need to make sure, one, that we're always relying on God, always. You know, I said we don't want to be relying on other people. We, want to, but we do want to rely on God. That is something because if we're not relying on God, it's just a matter of time before your heart is being lifted up and pride and prideful about your own achievements and your own wealth and your own ability to sustain yourself and everything else and say, I don't need God. God doesn't want you to not rely on him. God wants us to be at the place to where even if he's blessed you with wealth, that we're relying on him every single day. Because the things that we have, these things, they could come and go in, an, in a heartbeat. Anyways, it doesn't matter. That's not what we should ultimately be trusting in for our safety, for our security. We need to be trusting in the Lord. First and foremost. Again, I'm not saying it's sinful or bad to have some stuff. I think it's wise to be prepared. But we need to be careful how far we take that. And if we're doing, we need to have the faith to know that if we're doing what God is calling us to do, we really have no need to fear about anything. You know, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, we were having a conversation recently about um, end times and what's going to happen. And we know, you know, we believe here we're gonna, there's going to be a time of tribulation. There's going to be a time of persecution. It's going to happen. Maybe it's even going to happen in our lifetimes. I'm of the, the persuasion I think it is. I think we're that close. I don't know it for a fact. No man knows the day or the hour, but there's a lot, of, a lot of signs of the times that are happening that would lead me to think that it's reasonable to think that sometime in the next couple decades that we're going to be really going through some hard times and maybe even see that great tribulation. So knowing that, it is wise to have some type of preparation, knowing, hey, these things are going to happen. You know, if we have a little bit extra food, we've got a little, you know, some good means to defend ourselves. Excellent. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm honestly not very concerned about the coming judgment for myself. I'm not that concerned about the tribulation because I know that if I'm just doing what God wants me to do. If I am walking in the path that he's laid out for me, no matter what that is, no matter if I have no guns, no extra food, nothing to my name, if I'm doing what God has for me to do, I have got nothing to fear. I've got nothing to worry about. Because if I'm seeking God first, and if I'm walking in his will, and if I'm doing all these other things, the rest of that preparation doesn't mean anything. Look what he did for Elijah. Elijah didn't have to rely on anything he did. He said, God just said, here, I'm going to put you over here and there's going to be some birds to feed you and there's going to be some water there. Done. Problem solved. And God has shown himself time and time and time again to take care of his people, to take care of his children. And if God has it in the cards for you to be a martyr for his name, to suffer some persecution, guess what? It doesn't matter how many guns you got. <laughs> if that's the path God wants you to take, then so be it. Say, praise Jesus. Glory to God. Thanks for counting me worthy to suffer the shame for you. That's the attitude that the, the apostles had. Read the book of Acts. They got beaten and they left joy, you know, jumping up and down and leaping for joy because they counted that, God counted them worthy to suffer shame for his name. It was a good thing. We need to make sure we got the right attitude. And like I said, I mean, the prepping thing, it's fun. It's 
fun to talk about it. I like watching those videos and they got these big bunkers and all this other stuff. It's cool, but that's about the extent of it, right? Don't let it consume you. Don't get, and I don't think anyone here does, but just get to this point to where it's like, come on now, let's, let's just, let's just, I mean, let's rely on God. Get, get some preparation. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, that should not be where your resting place is, is on that stuff. We need to, be, to make sure that we're keeping our faith in God and, uh, and just completely relying on him. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 7, 1 Kings 17. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So the place where God had him, that water just, that river stopped flowing. So now he's out of water. Verse 8, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So God's already lined up a place for Elijah to go to next. You say, well, this ran out. Doesn't matter. God's got the next place for him to go. And he tells him explicitly saying, I have commanded a widow woman. Now, we don't know exactly how the widow woman was commanded. We don't know if she saw a vision in the night. We don't know if a man of God preached unto her. We don't know if she heard God speak. We don't know. Doesn't matter. All we know is that Elijah was told, hey, this widow woman was commanded there to take care of you, to sustain you. So he goes on his way, verse number 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Trusting in God, as he did before. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in, and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. So she's out there gathering sticks and he, he comes across her. He sees her. Oh, this is a wood, widow woman that God's commanded to take care of me. So he, he gets into town. He sees her. He says, hey, get me a drink of water. I'm real thirsty. And as she's going, he's like, oh, wait, 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 wait. You know what? Also, give me a little something to eat. Give me, give me some bread, right? And uh, so then she answers. She says, look, because she was going to get him the water. But when you ask for food, She's like, I got a couple of sticks here. I've got a little bit of meal. She said, not even a, a cake, right? Just this little bit of, of meal and a little bit of oil. She's like, we're going to dress these sticks and, and basically just, just that, that food that she had. She's like, we're just going to eat what we have now and we're going to die. And um, we see here how poor this widow woman is, right? Because she's at the point of starvation. And we know that, you know, there has been no rain and water and stuff. So obviously everyone's going through hard times. But this woman that, that God commanded to take care of another person has nothing. She's on her last, last bit of food. Now let that sink in. Let that aspect of the story sink in. Because as we're reading about Elijah, there's also this other woman who is a big part of the story. And we tend to kind of forget about the other people in the story and just focus on Elijah. But put yourself in that woman's shoes. If God's commanded you to take care of someone, you don't got anything. Say, I don't have anything, God. I, don't, I, 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 I want to help. I want to do something, but I don't even have anything. But here we see a woman that also has faith. Here we see a woman that still is going to do what God commanded her to do, even if it means nothing for her and her son. Because she takes him then. And, because, and, and it's, it's, kinda, it's actually a little, a little funny. I mean, Elijah reassures her with God's word that everything's going to be okay after she tells him that. But the way he answers her, I, I think, is still a, l a little bit amusing. Verse number 13, Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. He's like, go, go ahead, do what you said, right? Get your sticks so you and your son could eat and die. But make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after make for thee and for thy son. So, I mean, it's, it, I don't know. Maybe you don't see the humor in that. I think it's kind of funny. Like, okay, you, you could do that later, but first, first make something for me. And, um, and then he tells her again in verse 14, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, saying, this is what God said. 
The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. So he's telling her now, he tells her the reason why she can go and get him some food and then she could go and eat with her and her son is because God's not going to let that little bit of meal that she has left fail and that oil is just not going to run out. You could keep on pulling from that little bit and it's going to last you and last you and last you. In verse 15, it says, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And I think this is a great blessing for this woman to not take it upon herself to say, well, I don't have anything, so I don't have anything to give to you. I'm just going to eat for me and my son, and I don't care if I'm supposed to take care of you. I'm just going to take care of myself. She didn't have that attitude. She had faith in God's word. She trusted that she's going to be able to be taken care of. And she went and did. And even if it was going to be the last food, she, she made that little cake for, for Elijah. This whole chapter, chapter 17, the overwhelming theme is about faith. And we're going to see that. There's all these very difficult times that are going on. And yet the, the, the faith is, is the number one theme of this entire chapter. And it says in verse 16 there, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Of course it didn't fail, because God's word never fails. God's word is always um, true and faithful and will, will happen exactly the way that it says, if it's coming from God, which it was. Now, notice in some of the most difficult times when even just surviving seems impossible. God's care for his children. Even if it has to be a miracle, God will take care of his children. And, that, and that's, that's comforting. Again, more reason to not fear. No matter what's going on in our lives, no matter how bad things get, when, when you're at the lowest point in your life, if you're listening to God's word and following and doing what he has for you. You can have faith and confidence in that knowing that God will take care of you. That is comforting. And these stories are awesome that, that we can look to this and see, you know what? I've never been in this situation before. I never have been in there. I don't know what it's like. I could only imagine. But even what I can imagine, I, I, I would bet, is not as hard as it is to actually live through that. We have things so good in this country. We have a, such an abundance of wealth and blessing that, that it's, been, it's been here for so long that even me, at just about 40 years old in my entire lifetime, has never been to the point where my family, my house, or me was just so out of food completely that I just thought I was going to die of starvation because like this is all we have left. I mean, this is my last crumbs of bread that I have to my name. I don't know what it's like to be in that situation, but I know it can't be easy at all. Having a hungry belly and then being told to take care of somebody else. Praise God for this type of faith that this woman could have and that Elijah could have. And, it's, and Elijah makes it look easy, like it's no big deal. We know that it's not that easy. But we can look to someone like Elijah and get strength from that person and say, hey, look, if he could do it, why can't we? James 5 says he was, a like, he was a person like as we are, with like passions that we have. He's just a human being. He's just a person. But what makes him special is his faith. What makes him special is that he decided to trust God and do what God asked for him to do. Any one of us can do that. We all can do that. It's just up to you individually. You can be an Elijah. There's nothing stopping you from it at all but yourself. It's just yourself. God provided. See, we also need to be looking out for one another. God used what the woman had to offer, which wasn't very much. But what do you suppose would have happened if the woman refused to help Elijah? The story could have gone very differently. See, I don't think that God would have necessarily blessed her the way that he did because she was obedient, because she did do, because she, she was willing to offer this stuff. I think the story could have turned out way different. If she said, nope, sorry, 
I'm going to do this. I can't help you out. She probably would have died with her son. And you know what would have happened? God would have taken care of Elijah through someone else because he was going and acting by faith and doing what he was supposed to be doing. It would have, you know, the deliverance would have come from somewhere for Elijah. But this woman, don't know what would have happened if she would have just been disobedient and not, and not um, listening to God, to the word of the Lord. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 17, and it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. So we see this story here now. They, they've continued on. They, they've been eating out of their, the, the oil and the meal that they've had. It's been lasting them. But now her son gets sick. And he gets so sick that he dies. There's no breath left in him at all. And she's just like, why did you come, man of God? You know, it's kind of like, we were going to die anyways. What was the point of all this? What was the point of bringing me through this if my son's just going to die anyway? She's like, she's like, are you bring, you know, is God bringing to remembrance the sins of my past? Like, like look, I've sinned. I know. Like, why, why is this happening to me now? So Elijah turns to God and entreats and, and for her, entreats for her son. And just, you know, he's praying and begging God, God, you know, like, why has this happened? You know, you're bringing evil upon this woman that, that's taken care of me. I'm sojourning with, and, you know, what, why is this happening? And he, and, he, and he prays then to God, let this child's soul come into him again, God. Not holding back anything, knowing that God is capable of even bringing people back from the dead. This is where Elijah's faith was. This is one of the things that makes him so great is that he didn't just give up. He continued to rely on God and did what he could to, to help this woman and to help her son. The child was said, what a prayer, though. Let this child's soul come into again. Look at verse number 22. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. God heard him. He wasn't just speaking into the air. And the soul of the child came into him again and he revived and Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother and Elijah said see thy son liveth what an answer to prayer what an awesome event I mean this is this is extremely rare in the Bible we don't see this happen we saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead after four days this is like basically like the only other time where we see someone praying to God to bring someone back from the dead. I mean, we see in, um, in the book of Acts where, where the young man fell from the, the, the loft and you could argue whether or not he was dead. Um, I think he probably was, but, um, you know, whatever. This is not something that happens every day. But think about this, too. What a blessing this woman received. Like I said, that doesn't happen every day. But God heard Elijah's prayer. And great things can happen when you've got your faith in God and you're doing what's right. And you surround yourself with the right people. You've got you know, the, effect, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the Bible says. Elijah was a righteous man and he effectually and fervently prayed for this, this boy that, that died. And God brought him back to life. The stories of Elijah highlight how anyone can be used of God if they're willing and faithful. And we're going to see that. We're going to continue through the life of Elijah. It's, it truly is incredible. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, Elijah just shows up in the Bible. Just out of nowhere. I mean, it's just we're reading through the book of Kings, reading about all these kings of Israel recently who are just real wicked and there's all this stuff going on and then Elijah shows up on the scene. Just out of nowhere. Just a man of Gilead. And we're going to read some amazing stories about him in the next few chapters. And then that's, that's pretty much it. 
But you know, we, we need more Elijahs. We need more people who, are, who have that faith and are willing to just go out there and do what it is that God's got for them to do. And, and not ask questions and just, and just have full faith that God's able to do what, what he's able to do, um, which is anything. Second, we, we, we referred to this, I think, uh, one or two weeks ago. When we were talking about Asa. And the man of God went to Asa and explained to him in, in 2 Chronicles 69, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. That's what, what the, the man of God said to Asa. Why? Because Asa was the one who did rely on God militarily when they were outnumbered two to one, when there was you know, a million people against 500,000, and God wrought that victory. And we're kind of used to seeing those types of victories in the Bible with God, these, these military victories. But this statement about the eyes of the Lord running to and fro throughout the whole earth is very true. And as I mentioned before, I believe this is still happening today. He's going to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. God's just looking for someone who has a, that has a right heart. Someone who just wants to serve him and, and, and do his will. And, and, and he's willing to... Uh, he, he does. He's not just willing. He uses men to promote his will, to do what it is that he's got lined up, and, and to do great things. When Asa won that battle, that wasn't Asa's victory. That was God's victory. When this boy was brought back to life, that wasn't Elijah's strength or power or special magic that Elijah had. That's the power of God. But God used the man to perform the miracles. The miracles were performed through somebody. Elijah was the vessel, but he was the willing vessel. He had a, a, a perfect heart before God so that God definitely gets all the glory. There's no doubt about that. Elijah's not taking credit for this stuff, just like the other men of God don't take credit. Moses didn't take credit for all the plagues that happened upon Egypt. But the plagues came after Moses and Aaron, you know, spake the word of the Lord and were there to represent and be ambassadors for God. He used those men to do, to accomplish his goals. And just like here, he used, he used Elijah. He, he listened, he heard Elijah. I mean, Elijah had to be there to call on God and to ask him to, to save this boy in order for that boy to come back to life. That's, just, that's the way God operates. We see that throughout the Bible. That's the way he works. Verse number 24. The Bible says, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. And I find this to be kind of interesting. It's as if the miracle of being fed all that time didn't mean that much for her to say, you know, like, well, now I know you're a man of God. Right? Now, I don't want to you know, be too hard on this woman because it did say just before that that she did call him, O man of God, when she was talking about her son there in verse 18. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Right? She, she knew he was a man of God. But with such an amazing event that happened, she's just saying like, now I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. Like, no, there is no other explanation for this at all. You're a man of God. The word, the word in thy mouth is truth. You're speaking from the Lord. Now, but, but the reason why I bring that up is that, you know, all too often I think we miss seeing God's hand in our own lives. I think God's interventions or God's leading and guidance is there more often than we realize. I believe that. I've seen it enough in my own personal life to know that it's there, to know that it's true, to know that the, you know, the, the things that, that some people might want to chalk up to coincidence isn't just a coincidence. And um, 
oftentimes I think we just miss seeing that, even though it may be very significant. I mean, that, that in her case, that food and being fed for so long, that was very significant. But events like that can dull over time. I mean, think about it. every single day was a miracle that they were eating. Every single day, and we know that it hadn't even rained yet, so even up to that day, it was a miracle that they were still being fed. But the fact that it was there got old. I mean, we saw that with the children of Israel when they're wandering around in the desert. God fed them with manna, right? Same thing. He took care of them. They had a need. They're out in the wilderness. They can't provide for themselves. God provided for them. He says, here, I'm going to have bread just basically coming up off the ground. When the, when the dew lands on these plants, you just pick up for where, like, where the dew came off and, and you got this manna and it's bread. And you could eat that. And they were amazed at first. Praise God, he's taking care of us. Look, all we got to do is just collect this food and eat it and we're good. But then what happened after a little while? We got sick of it. Started complaining. Oh, I remember the garlic and the cucumbers and the melons and the, you know, and the fish and the leeks and the you know, onions and everything else that we had. And now all we got is this manna. I mean, we you know, try to boil it, bake it, do whatever with it. But all we got left is this, is this manna. It's like it's a miracle from God. God's taking care of you. You have to work for it. You're going to complain about it? God is miraculously taking care of you. What is wrong with people? But look, the children, they weren't just completely way out there comparatively with other people. That's a mindset that a lot of people have. It's not just them. And we need to, to remember that. And we need to remember not to ignore the smaller miracles, right? I mean, the, the hunger was the biggest thing in her entire life at that point when that need was met. But then as soon as that need's met, unfortunately, I think we have a tendency to just don't think about it anymore. The bad part's passed. I don't want to think about that anymore, even though God still deserves a lot of credit, all the credit. It always blows me away how many people seem to not fully realize what's going on around them when miracles are being done in their presence, like in the Bible stories, right? You see Jesus, for example, he's healing all these people. I mean, it's undeniable, all the great things he's doing, yet there's still people that just don't believe. We want to kill him. Like, how? How does that happen? Just like when, when the, the children of Israel like came through and saw all the plagues of God, and then within such a short span of time, they're willing to just give up on God. They're willing to just say, oh, well, what? you know, it's like these miracles ought to have more of an impact on you. I mean, you, you need to, just see, to see these things. And, and it blows me away that, that anybody can have that type of attitude. We need to be sensitive to these areas where God does act and God is, is doing things in our life. A very similar story happens in the New Testament as with, as with the lady and, and Elijah being fed right? Because they have this the certain, a small amount of food. And you cannot explain away how they are continuing to be fed every single day. It's the same way that Jesus fed the 5,000, right? All they had in the group was five loaves and two fishes. That's it. There is no scientific way or reasonable way you can explain how can five loaves and two fish feed 5,000 plus people and then be able to take 12 baskets full of, of, of leftovers, Right? The stuff that people didn't eat. You, you, you're left with more than you came with. That doesn't make sense. Except because God's involved. And God's able to make anything happen. He made that food provide for way more than it would have otherwise. And this is what he said. This is what Jesus said to those that followed him after that. In the book of John, when, when after he had just performed that miracle, his disciples left and then he left, and then the people came looking for him. They're like, oh man, where'd he go? You know, and, they, and they caught up with him on the other side of the lake. And, uh, and they, were, they were asking about him. And then in, in John 6, 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. See, those people, they were looking for him, but it's not because they were in awe of the miracle. Because a great miracle was done in their presence. He didn't have more than five loaves and two fishes. And like, that's a huge miracle. But so many people just didn't even think about it. 
didn't affect them. They didn't, they didn't really care that much. They just cared, oh, cool, he's feeding us. So he went back looking to get some more food up from him. And he's like, you missed the point. You missed it. The woman here in, in, in 1 Kings 17 was eating off of what was only enough to be her last meal. And she was able to eat off of that amount for many days. But it's, it's almost as if she didn't recognize Elijah as a man of God until her son was raised from the dead. It took like that type of an event to just be like, you're a man of God. The feeding was no less miraculous than the son coming back to life. It really wasn't. But similarly, however, the resurrection, that resurrection, and, and I think there's, there's one last point I just want to tie in here with this. Because that's what it was. He brought the Son back to life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ ultimately proves that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, is the Son of God. That provides the ultimate proof for us in our Savior. I mean, that was the biggest event. I mean, think about what, what is a bigger event of Jesus Christ in his entire life and everything that he did than his resurrection. That's what provides us our lively hope. We have a hope of our own resurrection that when we die, that's not the end of it, that we're going to come back to life. Why? Because Jesus Christ died, went to hell after three days and three nights, came back to life of his own accord. No one else raised him. You could say Elijah raised this, son, this boy from the dead. I mean, through the power of God, Elijah did it. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead from no one else. Jesus Christ came back. Jesus Christ ascended up into heaven. The angels didn't carry Jesus into heaven. He ascended up to heaven. He went up of his own power, of his own volition. That is an amazing proof. By this we know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The same way that the widow woman knew that Elijah was a man of God when, when her son was brought back to life. I'm excited to, see, to, to read more. I, I mean, not like I don't know the stories, but just you know, getting into these and preaching through them and, and, and going through this. Elijah is an awesome character. We need more Elijahs. We, we, there's no reason, and I'm going to be preaching about this a little bit on the camping trip, there's no reason why the people we read about here, we can't do the same things. We need, we need to get the right mindset. Get ourselves out of the way and let God use us the way that he wants to use us. He's looking for it. I mean, he's, he wants the right heart. Is there someone with the right heart to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Whatever you want me to do. I'm not going to get scared. I'm not going to say I can't do that. I'm not going to, you know, find every other excuse not to do what you've got for me to do. I'll just do it. And just know that, that I'll be fine and I'll be protected because I'm, in, I'm doing what you've got for me to do. So that's the attitude Elijah had. He was no, other than that, he was no special person. Elijah the Tishbite from Gilead. You could be a, another Elijah from Prescott Valley. Doesn't matter. God's the one who gets the glory anyways. It's not It's not you. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for these great stories in the Bible. Lord, help us to, to have more faith. Help us to be like this woman who was willing to give a, of the last, uh, literally the last food that she had for her life and for her son's life, dear Lord. Um, and she did it willingly because she trusted in you. God, help us to have that level of faith. And um, Lord, help us to, to love other people enough to to be willing to do that, God. And, and um, we ask for your guidance. We ask for you to, to lead us the way and, and work in our hearts. God, I think there are a lot of willing people here tonight that, that want to serve you. And, and we just ask that you would um, illuminate us, illuminate the path before us, and help us have the boldness and the courage to, to walk that path that you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.